Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today is the third Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Heart to Heart with plant-based cardiologist, Dr. Columbus Batiste. Please welcome him to the show. It's so good to see you. Always good to see you. Nice. Well, I, I think you're a real doctor because you're wearing scrubs, right? Can't wear scrubs. <sighs> I'm a real doctor. You know what? Just in case anyone doubted, I had to make sure I put my scrubs on. <laughs> of course, you know, at Halloween, I saw a lot of doctor outfits, though. So <laughs> you could have gotten it with one of those stores. So how have you been? Anything new or exciting? When is your book coming out? Oh, my goodness. It's so <laughs> much exciting. I'm so excited about the book. I, I can't tell you. So that is April is the dude launch date. And so I have the cover. I have all the other stuff all set and ready to go. We're in the pre-sale mode and um, I'm excited. I'm excited as I've reread the manuscript. Now this is self-serving. I understand that. It's like a person who believes their house is worth $5 million. I think the book is incredible. I, I do. And, and, I, and I hate saying it, but I, I enjoy it when I'm reading through the manuscript to just proofread it. So anyway, I hope it, it resonates at least with someone out there um, who's going through different things and understands the fact that there's a holistic approach that we have to take when it comes to this thing called health. Right. And the central component is indeed real food, whole food, plant-rich foods. Nice. So. Well, please make sure that all the information to purchase the book you give to me so that we can put in the chat and the show notes so it's a clickable link. And when it really comes out, comes out, you've got to like do it. Even if it's a bonus show, we've got to uh, announce it to the audience. Absolutely. Nice. So who are we going to talk to today? Oh my goodness. So, you know, after all, it is Heart Health Month. This is my time of the year when we talk about Heart Health Month. This is what I live for. And so I had the good pleasure of meeting this gentleman here, Paul Berry, and his lovely wife, Tamara, um, in the past. And so we collaborated before and, and he started experiencing some events that I felt his story would be a wonderful opportunity for us to really walk through many of the statistics that American Heart Association uh, describes and really almost giving you a, a bird's eye view into what it's like inside of a clinic when I used to hold it in terms of going through in terms of a person's history and what we're doing and the transformations. And, and that's, that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, I can't wait to meet your guests. They are great. All right. Are we on? Are, are they? Yeah. So, Paul, Paul, you're up. OK. All right. All hey. right. So good to be to meet both to see both of you in person. It's been quite some time. How are you doing? Yeah. Good. Good. Doing much better now. Thank yeah, you very much. Much better. Doing great. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. I, I feel almost like if this is one like we're still in, caught in the pandemic and we're doing a video clinic visit right now. Yeah. And so, you know, this is, I know you, we had the opportunity to interact as it relates to um, several initiatives and so forth and, and share with the audience really kind of what changed clinically for you. I know you reached out to me at a certain point, but let's go back in time to what, what transpired. And Tamara, I want you to jump in, make sure you hold him to the fire. I love when the spouse and their significant other is there just to make sure we course correct a little bit. So okay. we're engaging both of you. All right, Paul. All right. So yeah, the story, you know, about heart disease for me starts back in my twenties. Um, when I was in college, uh, my last year at college, my dad died of a heart attack. He was 52, major heart attack died. And, um, you know, I was in my early twenties at that point. And then by my late twenties, around the time Tamara and I met, we were both working in Dallas. Um, I was having some chest problem, you know, chest pains and so forth. And I went to see a cardiologist, long story short, he told me that I had early, what he called early heart disease, and that I was going to be dead by 50 if I didn't change my ways. And, and this is how old were you at that point? I was, I think 27, 28, something like that. Okay. So, I mean, that's significant. So for our audience members out there, I think one of the key things that we know is that for men, we talk about a premature occurrence of heart disease and it's genetic if it occurs before the age of 45. We understand that, that now we know it's a genetic, it's a manufacturing type of issue that's there. And we also know from studies, as many of you uh, who watch the show and our followers, you know that heart disease can begin as early as the age of 10, before the age of 10, and it progresses silently 
and what studies have shown. And so what Paula is mentioning is an unfortunate event, but we know that this is this this can occur. Uh, sorry about that, Paul. Go, that's go okay. ahead. That's good. I didn't know that. Um, so um, I were I uh, he, he put me on a heart monitor for a few days mm -hmm. and monitoring my, uh, my whatever you guys monitor, you know, on a heart monitor. And um, came back and he gave me that, uh, I, I guess, prognosis, you know, that I needed to change my ways. And I said, what does that mean? And I was in my 20s working in the corporate world, you know, making decent money and having a lot of fun and uh, worked out really hard. I was in good shape, uh, but I also played really hard. And um, and uh, he gave me a, a one sheet uh, document and said, this is the first thing you should do is change the way you eat. Hmm. And um, again, this was over 30 years ago. Um, so I took that uh, and shared it with Tamara, who then was my girlfriend. And I said, check this out, man. There's like only one piece of fish a week and like um, a piece of chicken uh, another day of the week. And she said, that's that's a vegetarian diet. And I said, no, it's not. That's like political. This is for a healthy heart. And uh, how are we going to do this? And she said, well, let's figure it out. So a very long story short, we ended up going vegan eventually. We left we left our jobs, took a year off, uh, moved to New Orleans to learn how to be vegan, which is a really dumb idea. <laughs> it was it to, New Orleans, to New Orleans to learn how to be vegan, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And I know you know about that. You, you from the you from back there. So so we moved there and um and we met some really great people that that uh, were 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 doing that uh, plant based vegan diet and we everything you know all the food I remember all the food looked beige. It looked really boring, and all the people, really nice people we met, they all smelled like patchouli, and um, and uh, but they were great folks. And uh, we long, we really, it was a long, uh, well, about a year. It took us about a year to figure it out. I think um, that first year, and and we started eating what we called uh, um, a, a vegan food. And it, but Tamara and I branched off and went different ways. She. She found this book by this guy named John McDougall <laughs> called the McDougall Plan. Yeah, I think many have problem. heard of him before. <laughs> yeah, I want to come back to this uh, later on in the show because um, there's an important there's an important thing I wanted to share with you. But um, this is the book she actually picked up, and we both started reading it. And it, to me, it all sounded like uh, I'm sorry to say this, but it all sounded like cardboard. I, I was raised in the Deep South. You know, um, uh, eating all that great fatty fried food and um, lots of meat and dairy, and um, uh, I, I couldn't do it. I just, I she said, "Well, that's that's the way we, we need to go." And you kept putting it in front of me, but I didn't do a very good job of staying on it. Yeah, and I would convince him to do a week here or there of the McDougal plan, and and he would complain the whole week about how it was. He just, you know, he just didn't think it tasted very good. So he was just so used to heavy salt and fat and, you know, even eating a vegan diet, you can be very unhealthy. So that was kind of the path that he took. And I, so I, I, I really always wanted us to eat the McDougal way, but we just. Uh, yeah. So flash forward 30 years later, and we've raised two daughters vegan. Mm -hmm. Um uh mostly her way not mine <laughs> but so, they have so when you so your your journey towards becoming vegan was ignited based on the, the health challenge that was there and yeah. then it later evolved into the totality of animal rights and environment and everything of that sort and yeah. however you took different pathways is that correct well, that's not what he meant by different pathways. He, I wanted to go the healthy route. He wanted to go the junk food vegan route. Which is the way I always have And been. really, the animal rights aspect really was, that was what really influenced us to go vegan and stay vegan. And, uh, but it didn't, uh, it didn't, you didn't have to be a health food vegan. You could be a junk food vegan, which is how he, he figured that out quite quickly. You know, even though yeah. there wasn't a lot of choices back then. You know, you can make it work and still get what you want. Ab 
Absolutely. So, so Paul, when you, when you were eating for during those 30 years, um, were you, did you still feel as if you had protection against disease because you were vegan, even though you were eating a quote unquote junk food pattern or the, I like to call it the standard American diet, vegan style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. And I, I just want to say that, you know, those people I said smelled like patchouli, they actually became great friends and <laughs> they were very impressive to us. And we uh, we would go to a vegetarian potluck that they put on once a month. And that's how we learned to eat vegan um, was going to their potlucks in New Orleans in the basement of a little church in Uptown um, on Britannia Street. And um and we, we got to know them better and we started doing some volunteer work for them. And that's pretty much what we did that whole year. We took off as volunteer with that, with those folks. It's they're now called the humane society of Louisiana, by the way, mm -hmm. they're still going the founder um, and co-founder Jeff Dorson and Dana Ness, but they're amazing people still doing that great work down there. We, we greatly, we love them very much. Great people. So, um, but yes, we, we went our separate food paths. Tamara, Tamara was always a healthy eater. She stayed a healthy eater when she became vegan. I was always an unhealthy junk food eater and I stayed an unhealthy junk food vegan, uh, uh, junk food eater when I became vegan. And that's, that's where we took our diets the next 30 years. You know, um, she, she famously says in our family famously says, I tried to tell him, you know, ever since the heart attack, you know, that I eventually had, I'm sorry to give away the punchline, but yeah, 30 years later, I had a heart attack. And, um, you know, I had trouble managing my weight. I was on yo-yo diets all along. I've always done that. I've always worked out a lot and um, I don't have a problem dieting. I'm a great dieter and workout. You know, I can, I can binge with the best of them on, on eating and on dieting mm -hmm. and uh, exercising. So I could, you know, yo-yo down, but after a while, the toll that it takes on your body, I guess, you know, is, is way too much. And I would say probably I'm 60 this year. I had the heart attack 10 months ago when I was 59 and probably by my early fifties, my weight was just getting worse and worse. Um, we saw a picture the other day, I think, what was that? 55 probably. 50? Yeah. about that. And um, probably weighed about 250. You said about a 270. Yeah. That was, I couldn't believe how big and, I was. And how tall, how tall are you, Paul? Five, five, uh, five, nine. Okay. <laughs> five, ten, All right. Five, Gotcha. Gotcha. So you were, you were, you were ready to tote the rock uh, on the football field at that weight then, huh? At 270 and 250, yeah. 270. So, so leading up to that period of time, were you, were you before your, your heart attack, were you having high blood pressure or diabetes or health challenges at all that you were aware of? Great question. Because I was not, I, I, um, I didn't think I was, you know, looking back, you can see that, that, um, that yeah of course all the signs were there but i did not i was not on blood pressure pills i did not have you know any um i was not on any diabetes meds for for type 2 diabetes uh um and nor did i have any you know i didn't have any uh, inflammation um that uh I, I was slowly starting to feel like i might be headed toward blood pressure one day and that inflammation but i was able to manage it pretty well because again I, I i always exercised and even when i was as big as i was i was still pretty good at you know doing yoga and exercise yeah you were always strong you seemed to recover from things quickly if you know if you got the flu he got over it pretty quickly he just kind of powered through it because he's also a workaholic so you know he his work is really important to him and, and really takes a priority over his health. So uh, I think stress played a lot, a big role. Absolutely. And stress. we're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on that stress I, I component so. there. But, you I, know, I, I, I think one of the things, so I have to ask the obvious question, were you going in and getting checkups with doctors during those periods, that period of time when you said you were not diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, or anything else? No. No. Not no, so well, much. And, and so even you, more, not at all. And even worse, we were, we periodically would promote a, like a vegan diet challenge through our work. Mm -hmm. that we did. And, and people, um, and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the line I took was, it's so easy. All you have to do is go to the frozen food section and buy all the packaged stuff. It's so easy. And we even had a little junk food vegan, how to be a junk food vegan by eating nothing but packaged foods, you know, as a joke. And um, now I take it very seriously, of course, but 
Um, about the only time I ever went to a doctor's office was when we would we would do our blood test for in advance of those those vegan challenges, and then we would Got do it, it like, fourteen days later mm -hmm. to see. And there were always very modest movement. Uh, there was always a very modest movement. And uh, but I never got an alert about the blood pressure, really, um, much less uh, any diabetes. I never got an alert from those because it was a general exam. Uh, sure. So I don't know. And I think that and I, and I think that's important. I mean, and so just for those out there who are listening in, I think it's so important for all of us, myself included. So I always joke around and I say I need to see another doctor than the one I see every single day in the mirror. Right. That's important that we all do that. And so knowing what your blood pressure numbers are, ideally less than 120 over 80, not shooting for 120 over 80, but lower than that. I understanding in terms of the inflammation that's represented by cholesterol. So it's not just cholesterol by itself, but understanding that it's multifactorial. We talk about the bad cholesterol, but really looking at the ones that cause the most damage, your small dense um, LDL, understanding what your C-reactive protein and marker of inflammation is perhaps the APO protein B, understanding these different um, parameters are important in predicting, listen, is what I'm doing really reaping its benefits? Is there return on investments towards my health? What's your your um, your diabetes like? You know, or do you have diabetes or do you have the moderate thing? You know, my dad used to always make this statement, you know, um, you know, in, in terms of just like a little bit, a little bit, you know, you keep saying a little bit, it's going to add up to a lot. And that's what we know as it relates to something we call mm -hmm. metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is where you actually have an increase in your abdominal size. So your waist circumference, which means your belt loops. We know that you have just a little smidgen of elevation in your cholesterol, just a little smidgen elevation in your blood pressure, just a little smidgen elevation in the way your blood sugar is controlled. And that's what we call syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. We know that that is, more, is highly predictive of future events, those little bits, it's almost like saying you're a little bit pregnant. Either you are or you're not. It, it's it's a marker that there's a major fire going on inside of your system that we have to quench through multiple fashions, uh, factions, most importantly, the nutrition. So I think that's an important driver to uh, point to bring bring out as we're having this discussion too as well. So fast forward. So you 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 were doing well, and I get it. Making a joke. I used to make jokes all the time before I came into awareness and understanding about nutrition. I say, I, I just do good. You know, four out of five, four out of seven days. I said, no one, no one loves anything seven out of seven days. Your job. You know, my wife doesn't even love me seven out of seven days. I would just joke <laughs> with patients. I said, just do, just do pretty well. You know, and I look back at those statements, those little quips I used to make. Now, some 12 to 15 years ago, and I just think, man, what was I doing? How many lives did I send down the wrong pathway with this misinformation? So I think this is an important discussion. All right. So tell, so tell us about the symptoms that what, what really alarmed you that made you recognize things were different? Or was it you or was it Tamara that first recognized certain things that were happening with you? Well, I just I want to underscore your point about metabolic syndrome. I think that's exactly the description of me, what, what you just said, that everything was slightly, you know, getting worse over time, but it wasn't terrible and it wasn't, you know, crossing any major thresholds where the doctor would say, we need to talk, you know. Yeah. But, um, I think I had that. And because we have a friend who's got going through that now, we're, we're actually helping him based on the advice that I got from folks like you. Um, which I hope we can talk about because your advice was really essential to me turning the corner on really facing what I was up against. For sure. Yeah, he was seeking, you know, information from the doctors and nutritionists and people that are part of the program that he's in. And, and he just wasn't getting the, the information the same way you were giving it to him. And, yeah. and it just wasn't as thorough. And uh, it, it seems like the medical field has a, a ways to go in um, really being honest with patients. Uh, yeah. It seems like they're kind of trying to cast a wide net and if you can just do a little bit better, then you'll be okay. But that's, it's really not enough. You have to really change everything. Yeah. So we'll probably come back to that because, yeah. but to answer your question, um, what was the first sign? The first sign was a heart attack. I, I didn't see it coming. I had no idea, no thinking. It wasn't on my mind. Um, I did have some chest pains a couple of about two years ago. Um, 
during, it was a really stressful time, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we were going through a lot uh, in our family and, um, and with work. It was a really stressful time and the chest pains were pretty scary. And um, I went as far as one night I drove up to the emergency room. Um, the girls were gone. Tamara was staying with our oldest daughter who was having a baby, who had had a baby, was having a baby. I can't remember where it was. Oh, it was longer than two years ago, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I went up, I drove up to the parking lot of the uh, emergency room and just sat there and I uh, was trying to do breathing and to see if it, it would go away. And it didn't get worse. So I thought, well, maybe I just need to go and chill out back home and, you know, get with my cats and and uh, dogs and uh, and just do some breathing exercises, which is basically what I did. Mm. And I wish I had gotten checked because I probably could have avoided the heart attack that happened two years later. And the heart attack, my heart attack was the first sign that something was really dangerously wrong. I had uh, the widow maker heart attack. Uh, uh, complete blockage of the left anterior descending artery. Um, only about uh, your, your people, the, the uh, doctors say only about 12% of uh, patients survive that. It was a really bad one. So, yeah. And so you had chest pain when you went in with the heart attack itself. Oh yeah. Oh, it was, yeah, we were, we were out, we were working outside. Tim and I were working outside and um, we were in the garden, working in the garden. And I think I was doing something with the chainsaw and, um, we were hot. It was just a hot, it wasn't terribly hot. And, uh, I just, uh, couldn't catch my breath. And, um, I, the, the chest pain wasn't terrible. It was there, but it wasn't terrible, but the, the, I just couldn't catch my breath. So I sat down and couldn't catch my breath. And I, um, uh, Anyway, long story short, when it went up in the bathroom, went came back inside, went in the bathroom to try to cool off and um, and then hollered down at Tamara and said, uh, uh, I, I think I'm I think I've got a problem. And by the time she she came up uh, and found me in the bathroom, I was, I was out on the floor. I was on my back mm -hmm. and um, or maybe on my knees. I was I, got, I had gotten sick, you know, uh, I vomited. And, um, and then I, uh, I couldn't catch my breath and the thing, only thing I knew to do was lay down. And I, once I laid down, I couldn't get back up. I just didn't have, I didn't, I couldn't have the, the energy to get back up. The chest pains were coming more and more. And, um, and so she called 911 and, uh, the ambulance finally came. <laughs> and, um, I think there was a problem finding the house or something, but, but, uh, yeah, they took me into the emergency room right up, went right right past the emergency room right up to the heart lab the cath lab and and they uh um found the blockage really quickly it was amazing how 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 they were just like clockwork man the whole big team of folks and how how smooth everything went and how they well they took care of you once you're in there but they removed the blockage uh and uh installed a stent mm -hmm. and um and as soon as that stint got in there, uh, I started feeling a lot better. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and then then they started talking to me about what was going on. But there was a time there where they were pretty concerned. And there was also a time in the ambulance. I think I lost consciousness a little bit. I don't know mm. what, what was going on, but it wasn't very long. Maybe, you know, maybe 30 seconds or a minute at the most. But um, so, so let me walk back through some of this because I think it's important factors. You know, I think even if we go back to several years ago when you described having a bout of chest discomfort um, yeah. and before the heart attack, that was almost like the warning shot. And yeah. you start, you described it as being surrounding the circumstances of, of an increased level of stress. And so what studies have told us um, continually, especially the inner heart trial that came out roughly around two, the early 2000s study, you know, international study looking at risk factors, identified that both personal and workplace stressors even when you normalize for high blood pressure, diabetes, result in substantial amounts of risk, about two times the amount of risk for, for heart attacks. We understand that there's there's conditions called broken heart syndrome. I talk about that an awful lot. And and we understand, you know, even in Japan, they have another one called um, Kiroshi, which means sudden uh, death due to overworking and from stress itself that's there. So it plays a substantial role. And wow. we can I can dig into the pathophys of how that really transpires to really put strain 
on the heart in those particular instances. But when you identify, and for you, you have fairly classic symptoms. You had chest discomfort, you had shortness of breath, you perhaps had a little sweating, you had nausea too as well, and the profound fatigue. And that's useful. But one thing that I would tell you, and everyone's important for you to understand, you may have had small micro heart attacks before that, silent heart attacks. We understand that roughly 20% of individuals across the United States have silent heart attacks, which means you never know. You think it's just a little something and you feel okay. And it's like, you know, I always describe it. It's almost like the Indiana Jones uh, movies where you go in, the archaeologists, they dig out these lost civilizations. Well, the same thing for us in, in medicine, we call them pathologists. When they go in after a person dies, they find heart attack upon heart attack that's healed before the one that finally takes their life. And so in your particular instance, you had an obstruction. The reason why we call that a widow maker is because of the amount of heart muscle that's supplied by that vessel. Think of it like the Mississippi River, right, um, um, is, is occluded up in the northern states. That means all of the United States afterwards, they're not receiving adequate water that's going to help the farmlands and everything else and drinking water, et cetera, et cetera. That's substantial when we look at that versus a small tributary coming off of it. It doesn't matter quite as much. Now, the other thing that's important to highlight is that, um, you know, thankfully, Tamara hasn't had that same situation, at least that we've dis discussed, but women oftentimes present so differently. It may just be solely fatigue. It may be just a little achy back. It may be just a little bit of nausea that's so different in the way that women present that they oftentimes go amiss because we aren't taking the time to really parse through some of the issues that are there. Uh, so the procedure you had, it was a life-saving therapy in that particular instance. That literally was. The moments in which you perhaps lost consciousness may have been from medications. It may have been because your heart started having an electrical circuit problem. And you mm. may have had transient um, electrical abnormalities that made you lose consciousness because of lack of blood flow to your brain. It's hard to say without looking through medical records, but that tells me about the seriousness of your situation in that moment. And so I think it's a blessing, number one, that you're here. And I think uh, your doctors did a phenomenal job in terms of, and the emergency medical system in terms of getting you there. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that irrespective of what your dietary practice and your lifestyle is, if you have these symptoms, you need to pay attention to it. <laughs> you need to seek evaluation because it, it not only could save you, it will save your life. Yeah. Yeah, right that's on. true. Yeah. So they got you in there. They recovered. The pain seemed to dissipate almost immediately because they basically burrowed a hole. You had an avalanche that occurred inside of this passageway. Yeah. The one road that, 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 delivers blood flow, you had an avalanche. So the doctors were able to go in there and tunnel a, a burr a hole in that rock quarry that was there and then displace the rock against the wall to allow traffic to go back down there. And that's phenomenal. And so you said the symptoms kind of went away almost immediately in that moment. Yeah, they did. Yeah, the, when the doc, the doctor who was installing the stent, he was just, he was like, he was so chill. He was talking to me the whole time, like right here, you know, like right next to me. And I was looking at him and while he was talking, I kept wondering when he was going to stop talking and actually do it. And I was like, I'm starting to feel better. He said, yeah, I just finished it. And I was like, you just did that, man. And because he went, he went through the, the vein. Yeah. And um, yeah, he would, it, that, that whole team was amazing. Um, I was in there, I think three days, three nights, four days, maybe. Yeah. And uh, they took they took good good care of me. And then um, after you know after that, you don't know when when you it was an avalanche. It was a sh the shock of an avalanche. And and um, and it's still you know the, the three four days into it, even when we you know first finally got home, you haven't really the shock of it hasn't set it settled in yet. And uh, I don't know if you want to segue to this part or not, but but um, the avalanche really triggered really triggered, uh, uh, you know, a good understanding about what you go through when you have the heart attack and you go through just being in the complete care of, of, of experts, you just kind of let go and, um, let them do their magic and science. And, um, you know, my family was great. Um, Tamara and our girls and our grandson came up and hung out and visited. And, um, it was, a you know, three or four days in and then came back home 
And then they told me at some point in a few days after getting home, they said, we want you to come back and begin a program called cardiac rehab. And the cardiac rehab is a program that, uh, you know, took uh, the next six months. I didn't start it for about three weeks. Um, I think they prescribed a lot of medications and um, they wanted to see how those medications were going to do, how I was going to do on those medications. And after about three weeks, um, I was supposed to start cardiac rehab. And and uh, that went on for six months. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that, um, because I think when when you're a heart patient and, and that happens, um, but, but before, before it happens, uh, I can say that I remember with clarity still, I didn't really have any idea about what, you know, what I should be eating, I, even though, um, e even though I had read it, you know, I read it over and over again. Uh, um, I, I just thought that being plant-based or being on a vegan diet was enough. And, and I thought that being, you know, being able to exercise was enough. And I was really surprised that, 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 uh, that I had such a severe heart attack, even though I had had those warning signs. And even though 30 years prior, that doctor had given me, that cardiologist had given me that, that one sheeter, you know, about what we should be eating each week, I was really surprised. And I didn't, I didn't know. So I had to go learn all this stuff. And, and in the cardiac rehab program, they did it based on the Pritikin plan. And um, the, I have props. Um, the, the Pritikin plan is, um, a, you, you can tell us about this if you want to, but this is the booklet they give you and it's pretty thick and you get all sorts of materials with it. And then a few pages in it tells you, well, basically it tells you that you're going, it's a three-part plan. They're going to put you on a program for the next six months that focuses on your nutrition, it focuses on exercise, and it focuses on um, your uh, mind yes. mindfulness, I think. I can't remember the term they use, but but um, so uh, the exercise, uh, I'll come back to that if you want to talk to that but, uh, about that, because I, I didn't get, I, I will say this, I didn't get that exercise was about rebuilding your heart um, muscle, because my, my heart uh, was very compromised from that, you know, the scarring from that heart attack. And I, I didn't really quite understand that until I did some outside extracurricular research uh, on it, nor did I really understand what I needed to do nutrition wise. The, um, the nutrition plan that they have is right here. And it you know goes through five servings of grains, uh, five servings of vegetables. And then here it says two servings of, of uh, uh, calcium rich and they have dairy products there. This is daily. And then a serving of meat every day that you can have daily. So two servings of dairy and two servings. And this is the Pritikin plan. So I, I was surprised. And I asked, I asked the folks who were, um, who, who were doing the program. And I'm really grateful for this program. My insurance paid for it. Thank God we were able to have insurance, first of all. You know, so many people could not have gotten the care that I've gotten. We were just really lucky to have insurance yeah. at that time. And and what I'll tell you is it sounds like what you went through is one of the intensive cardiac rehabilitation programs. There's only three that are um, uh, validated by CMS, which is um, uh, for uh, uh, Medicare reimbursement. And one is the Ornish program. Uh, many of our listeners are, are familiar with Ornish, Dean Ornish and his work. And then obviously Pritikin. And I'll tell you that oftentimes what there, what many of these programs, at least in the construct of trying to to move people along the the vein, and this goes back to a point, Tamara, right. that you brought up earlier, is mm -hmm. the fact that they're they're trying to tailor it towards the masses yeah. to kind of get you where you're still able to, very similar to the the creation of the Dash diet. It was formulated based off of the observations and the research done on the vegetarian diet, but feeling as if the world would not adopt that. So let's go ahead and see if we can kind of tone it down a little bit to make it more palatable. And that, in my mind, is is a problem in a sense that if you're running a marathon, and I give this analogy all the time, I tell everyone it's 26.2 miles. Our process of getting to 26.2 miles may differ according to the individual, but that still is our goal. I'm letting you know that's our goal. Our goal is to get you to 26.2 miles. So my goal is to get you to a whole food plant-based diet. 
And in other words, the same way I'm up titrating medications because I feel there's an added value for whatever it may be, I'm up titrating the power of nutrition to help prevent as maximally as possible you from having a recurrent event, which the recurrent events, 20% of all the heart attacks that happen every single year are from a second, third, and fourth heart attack. That's how significant the recurrent events are, which totals close to about 200,000 individuals every single year annually will have a second, third, or fourth heart attack. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I hope I'm not in that category. So I, 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 I had a hard time following this and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I am hyper literal, but I'm not, uh, I, I just, this wasn't, I couldn't figure this out. And at some point I was getting frustrated trying to figure out what exactly I needed to be eating on a daily basis. And you and I had done some previous work before on some other projects and, um, you were an esteemed colleague and, um, and I, I thought I would reach out and say, Hey man, I just had a heart attack. And I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. And that's what I did. And you were really cool about talking to Tamara and I. And um, and I remember, um, you know, we talked about some of the doctors uh, that have written books on this. And I've got three of them here. Um, these are the three books that I read, you know, during that time. And, um, you know, between these three books, uh, this so this is uh, the Ornish Plan. And uh, this is the McDougal uh, Program for a Healthy Heart. And this is Esselstyn's um, Prevent Reverse Heart Disease. Um, the thing I'll say about these is that all three of them supported one of the main points that you get that you gave me, which is try to maintain your fats, your total fats daily around 10%, which I thought I couldn't even conceive what that would be because, you know, I had a lot of fats, vegan cheese. Remember, I was the junk food one. And um, uh peanut butter. I mean, I just, you know, um, that was, that was shocking. And I, I don't, I didn't get that shock that I needed from this, which you're, you're, you're right to say that this program is, is you both are right to say this program is cast for the masses, you know, to try to bring as many people along as possible. And I can't imagine how tough that job is because I will say, you know, the next, uh, well, let me share, remind you the advice you gave me. You said, try to keep your fats around 10% of your total daily calories. Don't eat anything after 7 p.m., which I thought, I thought you were just being mean then. <laughs> you said, um, take a walk after every, after your last meal, at least your last meal. That was really great advice. I didn't quite get it until I started doing it. And, um, and then you said, and I, th and I think you're going to do great. I think you're going to do great. In fact, Paul, you said, I think you're going to do great for six months. And then I think you're going to go back to your old ways. Well, you didn't, he didn't say that specifically about you. He said he sees a lot of people who do that. Well, after I said, say what? And he's, then he said, I see a lot of people that do, but I couldn't <laughs> believe he said, that. I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, shocked. that was kind of, boy, that's kind of hard on my part, man. That's tough <laughs> love right there. Yeah. He needed but, it. It really, it was a very important piece of information you gave him. Yeah. Because, well, and just just for a little clarity, because uh, just so folks can understand, I'm not really this mean guy out there, no, you know. And, you and we definitely that. want want like encouragement. But I'll tell you, what's important is that when we start to feel better, and we start to get back into our old routines that we have not really constructed a routine, a habit, this cue this Q routine re reward process, a smart approach to what the way that we're going about things. It's so easy for us to fall back during to moments of stress mm -hmm. to access a portion of the brain we call the limbic system, the amygdala. We go back to these old habits that stress gets us going back towards these old things unless we really have to rein in and identify it. And we have to, the key to success in any venture, just like in real estate, they say it's location, location, location. It's plan, plan, plan. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I try and and just really get into everyone's mind is you have to plan, 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 take the thought out of it, right? Because if you have to think about it, you're going to think wrong. My sister used to joke and say, you, you think long, you think wrong. And she's absolutely right as it pertains to, to, to patients in, in transformation. Um, so, you know, so tell me about the transformation. Tell me about the transformation with you. Tell me about, about um, your time. You reached out to me about, you mentioned about food addiction, I share with you about, about the chef, AJ. Uh, yeah. So well, that was talk. where I was going to go next because, and, and even the things you were saying just now about, you know, 
think long and you think mm-hmm. long, you think wrong. I can't remember. Um, T- Tamara had advice like that. I mean, you you remind me a lot of each other, actually, the advice I was getting from her, the support, you know, and the caring support and and uh, and and so forth. And and it was, you know, it was kind of like just do it type, you know, advice. I would I, it sounded like that to me, like, I, you know, don't don't think this way, think that way. And and I and I didn't know how to tell you, much less you after 30 years is I I can't not think about food when I'm stressed out. And I am always stressed out because I maintain a high level of stress because I feel like there is some urgency around the work that I do. So therefore I've accepted the burden. This is my story that I am now acquainted with. It's taken me 10 months to get acquainted with. Uh, thanks in very large part to Chef AJ, which we'll come to in a minute, is that um, I, I don't think that way. I don't have those, you know, I, I don't have that, uh, I guess, level of awareness to be able to to choose the way I think. Um, to me, it, it, there's not a choice. Um, I, I, at least, you know, 10 months ago, there wasn't a choice. I've been working on it really hard the last 10 months. And when I first, you you actually in that call, when I asked you, what did you mean by what's going to happen in six months? Why am I going to go back to that? Because now I know everything. Why would I go back to that? And the only, you know, I was raised by an alcoholic and my father. And the the that's the main, my main understanding about addiction was watching him destroy his life, you know, and, and almost all of ours that were in his orbit. And uh, it was, you know, it was a real tragic story and he couldn't stop even though he knew better. And he was a smart man, you know, he could accomplish, he, there was a lot that he was able to accomplish in his life. And I, I don't, I, I, you know, couldn't understand why he did that ever in, in my life. And I realized that what you were basically saying in a very gentle way is that I might be, I might have an addiction to these, to these foods that I can't say no to. And that, and I, I am also, I, used tobacco most all my adult life, pretty much all my adult life, including smoking. And I was a big smoker up until um, uh, a few years back, four, three, four years ago, four years ago when I uh, quit, uh, finally for good um, after 40 years. Um, but um, so that's in addition. Uh, and uh, but I, I remember, you know, it was quite normalized to be able to say I'm addicted to cigarettes and I'm struggling to overcome this addiction. And I know now that I can't ever have cigarettes in the house because if I do, I will go smoke them. And I understood that about addiction. I also understood remembering back to my father's orbit around uh, alcohol is that we couldn't have any, we couldn't even have mouthwash with alcohol in in the house, you know? Mm. Um, So, because, uh, you know, for the same reasons, he couldn't have alcohol around. And if he take got one, even one taste, it would just start that avalanche of, of um, behaviors. And same thing with smoking. I mean, I failed so many times at quitting smoking because I would just have one or even smell it and go, go bum one up with somebody. And then the next day I was back to a pack a day. When I finally looked at food through that prism, to see if maybe there are certain foods that I just can't have in the house. I wasn't able to do that until um, you, when I asked you about why six months, you said, well, there might be, you know, some people look at you were very careful about how you worded it, but you said, I should go check out chef AJ and she, because she has an upcoming program that's about to start in a week or two, you said, and, uh, and she talks about these, you know, people who struggle with binge eating, I think is how you finally softly handed it, handed it off to me. I was all oh, binge eating. Well, yeah, I could do that. I do that. Sure. So I ended up taking her course and, you know, long story short, man, she, that course changed my life. She completely normalized the idea and understanding of food addiction, looking at your behaviors around food through the prism of addiction. And that's what I've been doing the last 10 months. I reread her book. Uh, I'm sorry. I reread Dr. Lyle's book, who she reintroduced me to. I had read his book back in 2010, 2011, um, actually doing research about the corporate food system and what it was doing to people. I was looking mm-hmm. at through the lens of, you know, with the cognitive dissonance of research um, and wasn't even realizing that I was one of those who had been affected by mm-hmm. you know, hyper palatable foods, which is what Dr. Lyle writes about in the first half of his book. In the other half of his book, he talks about here's how people who were addicted can get over it. And here's what they need to do to overcome food addiction. And uh, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to the second half of the book. 
I was just looking at the first half, trying to make corporations wrong. <laughs> but uh, and and there's plenty of that out there that needs to be said, of course. But the other half of it, you don't really, you know, I didn't get that in the predicate plan. Um, I didn't read much about food addiction in those other three books either. It was it was you very carefully introducing me to that idea. And, and uh, you know, and I really appreciate you creating a, a space of comfort. So I, I didn't feel ashamed to even go, you know, consider it. Um, and Chef AJ, what she does in normalizing it is she talks about her own journey and how she how she had to work really hard and, and, you know, and stumbled along the way a lot of times, but she made it through. And, and just, just hearing, you know, day after day, her, we, her daily insights that she shares by email, she keeps reinforcing it because it's, it's an easy idea to walk away from if you have an addictive disorder, because part of it is about tunneling, tunneling your thoughts and thinking specific to what is most predictable and what has always worked for you. And one of the things that has always worked for me is working really hard, overworking, whether it's physical labor or work labor, and then numbing myself along the way with food. That's sure. what I did. And I had to, I've had to relearn how to work um, and uh, relearn how to eat. And, uh, and then under the, you know, under the constraints of no more than 10% per day, you know, and, and when you look at what, what you're actually addicted to, you know, the, the, the ingredients that those corporations manipulate in those hyper palatable foods, there are typically fats, sugars, and salts. And so really, really understanding how much fats I could have per day was crucial in me even beginning to seriously confront the problem of food addiction. So the 10% number was really helpful. You gave it to me. All three of these guys gave it to me. Um, Pritikin actually, in some of his stuff, his early stuff, he actually talks about the 10% fat thing. That was that was really my foothold and rebuilding my approach to food um, and the bowls approach that you that you advised the bowls approach, learning how to to eat in a different way than the three structured meals. You know, was um, that that was huge. And Tamara, Tamara was a, a, an incredible trooper throughout all of this. She went every day with me to cardiac rehab and is still, I'm still in rehab. I'm still going three days a week. And um, she, she goes with me to that every single day. Um, she's completely changed her diet to, to accommodate uh, the new way of eating that I have to eat. And um, that's really helpful. I think not being alone in this, uh, um, and and also the great you know she's a great uh, she's great in the kitchen and uh, knows you know she raised two, two two kids and 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 now helping raise a grandson on plant based vegan foods and uh, she's really super sharp she even has a, a food plan that she put out as part of her own activism that that uh, that 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 we that we're working on promoting um, for folks who you know eighty percent of people struggle living paycheck to paycheck in yes. America. And one of the first things that gets compromised is their their groceries. And they end up trading cheaper groceries that are, you know, typically hyper palatable. And she's done research about, you know, the, a lot of people say plant-based or vegan, the vegan diet is um, an elitist diet because it's so expensive. And the research that she did, she did this for us a couple of years ago for a project. And um, tell them about the research you found uh, that you did when you put that, she put a food plan together to see, you know, how a healthy Cost food comparison. Yeah. How yeah. It was just basically, I was just trying to do uh, kind of a framework, three meals a day and two snacks and do it, you know, all whole, as close to whole food, you know, and, but all plant-based and just doing it as economical as possible. And when I got to the end of it, because we're not incorporating a lot of, uh, you know, processed foods and things like that, the cost was very reasonable. And oh. it was very exciting when I got to the end of it and saw the bottom line and compared that to what a family would, of four would receive from um, uh, if they were on government assistance. Food assistance. And it was actually like $20 less. My grocery list was $20 less than the than they would receive at the time and so it was it was kind of an eye opener it was like we just we just busted a myth that has been around forever that whole food plant based is is not affordable 
because it's actually yeah. cheaper than than all the rest. So yeah. So um, a family of four, a family of four can do her food plan for the full twenty eight day food plan for um for for uh, if they're on government food assistance. That that's pretty huge, and it shows you is. how if you're doing it right, it actually isn't expensive. And because her plan is super healthy, it's whole food plant based. But um, uh, anyway, so she she stayed with me and worked worked with me has stayed with me uh, on on the food uh, on this healthy heart food plan the whole the whole ten months and been a huge trip and doing all the exercise work too. So yeah. having a purpose. yeah, it's it's crucial. But also one of the things too, I think that anybody who has who goes through something like what Paul went through you really have to take an interest in the food that you eat. You can't just let someone else fix all of that food for you. You need to get in the kitchen, figure out what's in your food, learn how to do simple recipes, even learn how to cook beans in the crock pot. It's the easiest thing in the world. And it's the most delicious food there is to me. I, I, so, um, but really take an interest and be part of that and claim ownership over your health because that, that's, that, right. that's how you're going to get in it and stay in it. And, and, I, and I, we should correct that. I, so she doesn't cook all my meals for me. She has taught me a lot of her recipes. And yeah, I just point. came up with some new stuff. And so we kind of, it just sort of fell into a natural rhythm of, I do a lot of, I do about half of the stuff. He does about half of the stuff. And we just kind of do a lot of, we've kind of got diff different areas of expertise, you know, that, and he's got some certain things that he likes. And so he makes those things and, you know, I, I'm constantly doing, uh, 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 you know, fresh beans for us because that's the, the main center of our diet and, um, it just works. We, we love it. Yeah. It's a I, love part it. I love it. That's, and that's so important is this, we understand there's data that tells us in terms of like having a close partner, perhaps marital, whatever it is is so important for longevity and for recovery of, of heart issues there. It helps lower the stress. So on so many fronts, your story is really bringing to the forefront a lot of the key important factors in preventing and really treating this thing called heart disease. You know, so I, I want to know, you, you mentioned that towards the, the beginning of this, that you were, you saw an old picture from several years ago and you were 250 to 270 pounds. What, what's your weight like now in comparison um, to things? And how are you doing in terms of overall, in terms of your feeling? Um, how active are you? How's your sleep? Let's let's hear some of the, uh, the, 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 the results right now. All right. Well, yeah, very proud to say that. Um, so I, I don't know how this happens, but when I had the heart attack, and I don't know how to say it, but uh, I don't know how to explain it because I don't understand how it all works. But uh, when I had the, the heart attack, I also had, I, um, or, or I was told, uh, diagnosed that I had uh, diabetes. I didn't know. I didn't know I had a blood sugar issue. Uh, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. They were shocked that I didn't know this, they said. And, um, and I also had an outbreak of, of arthritis in my knees and in my shoulder and something going on in my neck. I mean, chronic inflammation. And I say that you know, because I had never had any problems like that before. So I had to start, I had to work on heart health, uh, including diet and exercise. I also had to figure out this arthritis thing so I could move enough to be able to do the walking that I needed to do to at least try to start getting up some cardio and, you know, work on heart recovery. Um, and, uh, and then the diabetes, um, you know, to, I, I knew that it was related to the food I was eating and, um, uh, they put me on insulin, uh, not insulin. It was a, it's some kind of uh, diabetes treatment. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say all that and, and, and blood pressure. They, I didn't know I had high blood, blood pressure. They put me on blood pressure pills, uh, diabetes meds, um, and then some other meds related to the stent. Yeah. Oh, and cholesterol, high cholesterol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I'll just cut to the chase and, and say, I, I had a pretty, uh, um, uh, um, a, a very good recovery pretty early on into a three to four months. Um, and, uh, by six months, um, I had, uh, gotten completely off of the diabetes meds, um, completely off of that. My blood sugar was completely back, back to normal and completely sustained by my food and, and, uh, health, uh, workout habits. 
exercise habits. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, we cut one of your drugs in half. Which yeah. one was something that? related to blood pressure. Yeah. My mm -hmm. blood pressure is much better managed now. So, so the so the meds, um, I want to get as much of, off of the meds as much as possible as I can because I was having some trouble, I think, with the diabetes meds. And I, I called you along at some point along the way and you said advocate for yourself. You remember that? I do. Uh, yeah. So advocating and talking to the doctors and the cardiologist team and all that was was a, a, a really great move and learning how to exercise better than just quote doing cardio um, i learned about high intensity interval training which mm -hmm. greatly expanded my heart capacity my what they call the vo2 max and that's relative, right what's the hrv heart heart rate variability which is yeah. a marker of stress too as well so the more so think of it like if you're if you're tightly bound you know like mm -hmm. we say a stress person is tightly bound that means your heart rate doesn't vary much is very much very fixed. If you have, if you're more loosey goosey, you can go with the flow. You kind of go up and down, and it's a wide variability, and that's more in indicative of a parasympathetic tone, which is tend and befriend. It's restore um, and more beneficial for your your body and your heart overall. So huge beneficial effects from that as well. So that's wonderful. So meds have come down, feeling better. You're back exercise. You're exercising. Um, the weight is now roughly about oh. what. I'm, uh, I'm just just under 200. So wonderful. Uh, yeah, I lost a lot of weight and I feel great. Now, I wasn't trying to lose weight. I was just trying to stay on that damn diet, man. <laughs> you know, and figure it out. It's a great diet. It is a great Love diet. It. That's, a, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's yeah, that's the side of that's the side of the side effect is weight loss, right? When you eat healthfully yeah. for your for your body and for disease uh treatment. Oh man, yeah, weight, loss weight loss and clarity and well, another thing too is he he will come out of the uh, workout facility and he'll say that he talks about this hunger his his hunger is different after a workout that it he he describes it more as a, like a clean hunger because he's wanting he's craving foods that are healthy and he can't wait to get back home to have the healthy foods where that's not what he used to crave and so now yeah. it's just kind of it's a it's a great healthy feeling too oh to man sure. craving i'm so happy i'm so happy for both of you i'm so happy for both of you Thank right you. i mean this is this is this is an incredible heartwarming heart health month story right here as walking the, the complete trajectory and i think some of the take-homes points from my perspective are this number one is it's not it's not good enough just to live behind a label of saying i'm vegan it's the quality of foods that you're eating that become important. And so understanding the power of nutrition and moving away from standard American diet is extremely important. I think the point number two is, uh, use my, steal my wife's term, we have to inspect what we expect. So if we're expecting that we're living healthfully, we have to kind of go ahead and get the blood work checked. We have to go ahead and, and, and take our, our bodies in and make sure that, hey, is everything happening the way that I think it ha it's going, it should be happening? And I think uh, part number three is really the important, uh, there's actually more than just three, but, you know, stress, understanding stress. And, and I love what you said. I'm wired a particular way to go about life a particular way. And I always say health equals resiliency divided by stress. The stress may be static, but one thing you can change is the resiliency. What you're loading in to resiliency. Am I loading in my sleep? Am I loading in my relationships? Am I loading in my food that's building resiliency? Am I loading in my activity? All these things that now can offset this static stress that's there. Or am I adding more to my stress by the foods I'm eating and variables there that's lowering my health? And so I think this process in my mind is a perfect description of this health equation. You've learned to flip the script and start to add to your resiliency instead of your stress. The, the food before was adding to your stress. The smoking was adding to your stress, all these things. And now you flipped it. And I think that that's the take home point I see mostly for everyone out there is that you have to be committed, those of you out there during this Heart Health Month and every month going forward to adding to your resiliency and surrounding yourself with the old adage, birds of a feather flock together. So if you don't have a tamara in your life, then you have to find a Chef AJ community. Uh, yeah. There that you can you can bound yourself together and move forward to towards where you're looking to go, right? On. But it's 
It's been such a pleasure having you guys on. And this discussion has been amazing. It's inspired me to kind of keep at things, I'll tell you in all honesty, um, because hearing it from your voice as a patient and as a friend and as someone who's going through this process and identifying the fact that you have even more power of influence now with having gone through this, even yeah. before the, the influence that you had previously. So bravo to you. Thanks, Chef AJ, man. you have you have no, a you have I, a you have a class well, member here. Yes. I, I'm just so honored that first of all that you referred me and I when did you take my class, Paul? Was it just the last one? No, I, I knew you were gonna ask me that. And I meant to look it up and I forgot, but um I forgot to look it up. But it was uh so I had the heart attack in April. It was uh I think in June, sometime in June. Yeah, the, was it was like, so the summer one. This is amazing. I really appreciate what you said because we we have a lot of discussions on Chef AJ Live, the most recent one with Dr. McDougal about what word you use to uh, state that somebody has extra adipose tissue. I don't even want to say the word. <laughs> and so I get a lot of flack uh, from from even medical doctors because I I call it food addiction because that's the only word I have because they say, well, you don't go through detox. You can't die from it. So I appreciate both of your perspectives that at least where you stand, it's a real thing. So that, that was very um, helpful. Yeah. Well, thank you for your work. It, it was, <laughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am to have, um, to have, to, to be able to read those emails that you sent out every day. And you just keep putting, you just keep putting your authenticity out there and have great guests and, you know, great uh, teachers as well, like Dr. Batiste and uh, uh, Dr. Lyle and and Dr. McDougal. Yeah, it, it's it's a great program, and I, I I don't know. Maybe we need more science about food addiction. I don't know, um, but that that's what did it for me was looking at my habits through that, and he, even my habitual stress. You know, that there's there's something about the stress. Work maintaining that stress is a great way to maintain the excuse to keep eating the foods that you, that help numb you. So. Right. You know, what was harder for you, quitting smoking or quitting the hyper palatable foods? Definitely the foods. Yeah. yeah. See, that's why I feel like it is an addiction. You know, they say if it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck and people get so they spend so much time arguing about the words instead of helping the patient, you know? Yeah. It's okay. well in my mind, in my mind, it's semantics, right? So whether you call it addiction, you call it whatever you want to call it. We understand that there is something, a chemical uh, hold that grabs hold of people. And it's a mixture, the perfect science between the emotion and the history that we tie to relational issues that happen and experiences that we interplay that. And the food industry has done a wonderful, masterful job mm. of doing both of those, of interplaying between like our life experiences along with the chemical nuance to keep us going back for more and more and more. And so it's it's whether or not I call it that I'm going to reverse heart disease or I'm going to send into remission or what, I mean, those are all semantics. My goal is for a healthier outcome. My goal is to decrease your inflammation. My goal is to break the cycle of eating uh, unhelpful foods and nutritional stress, as I like to call it. And so I think that irrespective of what you label it, this is the result we're looking for is to have a transformation occur. Yeah, I, lo I love it. We Everyone loves success stories. Dr. Batiste, you can almost just do a series of just bringing your patients on like this. It's <laughs> Yeah. Well, you may not know this, Paul, but um, Dr. Batiste is on every month, so he doesn't get the free vinegar. But every guest, the first time they're on, gets two free bottles of California balsamic and the flavor of their course, <laughs> so that it'll make your salads more delicious. So be sure, Dr. Batiste, to connect us through email so I can offer him. And our Brussels sprouts, our air fried Brussels oh, sprouts. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, gosh, then you might want to get a flavor like if depending if you like spicy, sweet heat or smoked hickory, they're fabulous on on air on roasted or air fried Brussels sprouts. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, That's congratulations. Great. You must just feel so much better. You know, I mean, you know, when you're in the throes of addiction, because I used to smoke. And of course, when you're stressed, you feel like it makes you feel better. But doesn't it actually feel better when you can get rid of those habits? Yeah, it does. It, it, you feel like a new person. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it, you really do. And I, I had, I was grateful and, and blessed enough to have my insurance pay for some therapy. I've never gone to a therapist before. And it just so happened that I got connected with a food addiction specialist who mm -hmm. uh, was a practicing uh, uh, psychiatrist or practicing that. And she helped me understand the science behind it. There is there is some good science behind it and helped me look at it through through some of those. I didn't get to spend a lot of time where they're about six months, but um, it was great. And um, 
to 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 talk about getting through that addictive relationship with food and getting on the other side of it, you know, the same way we talked about uh, AJ about beating cigarettes is, you know, can you ever go have a cigarette now and just put it back down? Or is it something you can never go back and have? And, and so healing from that addiction or recovering from that addiction means that you just, you, you have the presence of mind and willpower to never go back. And understanding what healing meant, I think, uh, you know, with respect to food addiction, she was very helpful in that. And um, and I feel like I'm there. I feel I know now. Thank you for making it OK, AJ. I had a problem with no fat, low fat ruffles. If they were in the house, they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i could not stop eating them well that's the thing they want you that, to do that once you pop you just can't stop and you know some that's of the right. doctors that said that i'm doing a disservice calling it food addiction because then patients won't take personal responsibility but i think what i've done is for people that can resonate with that it makes them feel like there's nothing wrong with them that you yeah. aren't broken you're not damaged you may have had childhood trauma but that's not the reason that these foods were designed to be addictive and while there are some people that can drink alcohol and push themselves away from the bar and not be alcoholics. There's some people that can eat these hyper palatable foods in varying amounts like my husband, but people need to know that if you can't, there's nothing wrong with you. Their food was designed to create this, whatever you want to call it, addiction, proclivity, preference. So thank you. Yeah, and thank, thank you. For you. Breaking thank break. you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally am a fan of abstinence for me. Moderation never worked, but Hey, you know, if you can have it and be okay with your health and weight, go ahead. I just feel like it just not having any is easier than having a little. Right on. Same here. Thanks again. It's great. Great to find, great to meet you in person or oh, whatever. It, it is. Yeah. And Dr. Batiste, it's awesome to see you. Uh, Tim and yes. I talk to you a lot uh, yeah. week to week. We <laughs> and, and Chef AJ. So. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, so I wish you had made that. yourself known during the class. That would have been so fun. But thank you so much. I was embarrassed. Amazing. I was embarrassed to be there. Yeah. Oh, my God. No. Well, that's the great thing about Zoom. If you're embarrassed, you can turn your camera off and you can even change your name. You know, a lot of times in my classes, I just make a fake name when I don't want to be known. So yeah. it's okay. Well, yeah, thank great you. Great work so you're doing, both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All and thank right. you so much, Dr. Batiste. And happy heart health month, everyone. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. The show is going to be a little later again because we are running our summit at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time for another amazing transformation and success story. Rondi not only lost 200 pounds, but she kept it off. So you'll hear from the confessions of a recovering crapaholic. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.